What is up, guys? So today we are going to finish Theogony or the Theogony and definitely stick around for part two because it's got so much in there. It's really cool. You got the Battle of the Titans and the Olympians. I mean, you get to hear the massive battle that raged. We always hear about the battle between the two sets of gods, but this work really puts it into perspective and you see how massive the battle between the two are. And then this part two, you're going to hear about Zeus fighting Typhon. And then also what's interesting, it talks more in depth about Igate, the goddess that Wiccans and pagans like to just say is the goddess of witchcraft. And they, um, has rep that has a place in the realms of earth underworld and the sky. But there's so much more to her, and Isia talks about that, and then she's going to hear in part two. And this is it. This is the end, the finale of the Theogony part two. And as you can tell, my voice is tired from reading it. It's a lot, but it's a lot of cool stuff, and I hope you guys have enjoyed this. Cato joined in love with Forkee, smothered the youngest of the deadly snakes. That one who ate the gloomy, great hidden limits of the earth guards the all golden apples. This snake is of the generation of Cato and Forkee. Thetis bore to Okinos the swirling rivers, Nilos the Nile, Alphios, and deep edding Eridanos. Streamon, Mayedros, Istros, and of the beautiful waters, Fasis and Risos, and the silver swirling Achilios, Nisos and Rodios, Hep, Heptalporos, Heliacamon, Granicos and Aesops, and Simios, who is godlike, Hermos and Pineos, and Caicos, strongly flowing, and great Sangirios and Linden and Pothinos, Yunos and Arctiscos and Scamandros, who is holy, she brought forth also a race apart of daughters, who with Lord Apollo and, and rivers have the young in their keeping all over the earth. And since this rite from Zeus is given them, they are Pitho, Edimente, Iante, and Electra, Doris, Primino, Primno, Rihanna, like a goddess, Hippo, Climini, Rdia, Kelioi, Zeus, Clitia, Idia, Pisithoi, Plexora, Galaxora, and lovely Dioni, Melibosis, Dioi, and Polydora the Shapely, Kirkis of the lovely stature, and Oxide Pluto, Zinthi and Oxti, Persis and Inaria, Patria the Lovely and Men Menethosos, Menesto and Europa, Metis, Urinomi, Tilisto, rubbed in saffron, Chrysis in Asia, Luring Calypso, Erodia, and Tishi. Amphrio, Okio, and Styx, who all among them has the greatest em eminence. Now these are the eldest of the daughters who bore to Tethys and Okinos. But there are many others besides these, for there are 3,000 light step daughters of the ocean, scattered far and wide, bright children among the goddesses, and all alike look after the earth and the depths of the standing water. And as many again are the rest of the rivers, murmurously running, sons of Okinos and the lady Tithis was their mother. And it would be hard for a mortal man to tell the names of all of them, but each is known by those who live by them. Thea, 
brought forth great Elios and shining Selene, the sun and the moon, and Eos the dawn, who lights all earthly creatures, and the immortal gods who hold the wide heaven. These she brought forth, being subdued in love of Hy to Hyperion. Eurybia, shining among the goddesses, was joined in love with Creos, brought forth the great Estrios and Pallas and Persis, who shines among all his intelligence. Eos, a goddess couched in love with a god, brought forth Estreos, the strong spirited winds, and Zephros, the brightener Boreas of the headlong track, and Notos. After these, she, Erigenia, bore Isophoros, the dawn star, and all those other shining stars that are wreathed in the heaven. And Styx, daughter of Okinos, lying in love with Pallas, bore in their halls rivalry and sweet steeping victory, and also power and force, who are her conspicuous children. children. And these have no home that is not the home of Zeus, no resting place nor road, except where that good or that God has guided them. But always they are housed by Zeus of the heaven, heavy thunder. For this was the will of Styx, and the, that Okinid never perishing on the day when the Olympian flinger of the lightning summoned all the immortal gods to tall Olympus, and said that any god who fought on his side with the titans should never be beaten out of his privilege, but each should maintain the position he had before among the immortals. He said too that the god who under Kronos had gone without position or privilege should under him be raised to these according to justice. And Styx the imperishable was first to come to Olympus bringing her children as her own father had advised her. And Zeus gave her the position and gave her great gifts further, for he established her to be the oath of the immortals, and that her children all their days should live in his household. And so, as he promised, in every way he fulfilled it throughout. But he himself kept the great power and is master. Now Phoebe, in turn, went into bed of love with Koyos, a goddess with a god, and there, through his love, she conceived and bore Leto of the dark robe, a sweet goddess always, kind to mortal men and to the immortal divinities, sweet from the beginning, gentlest of all who are on Olympus. And we all know who Leto is, the mother of Apollo and Artemis. And what they said of Leto, again, is that she was the sweetest from the beginning and the gentlest of all of those on Olympus. She bore also renowned Asteria, whom on a day Persis led home to his great house to be called his true wife. And she conceived and bore Ikate, whom Zeus, son of Cronos, honored above all others. Um, and that's the big thing about Ikate is that they, she's always out of all the titans was the one that was honored above all others for he gave her gifts that were glorious to have part of the earth as hers as well and part of the barren sea and she with a place also in the starry heaven and thus exalted exceedingly even among the immortals for even now whenever any one of mortal men makes a handsome sacrifice and appropriation according to usage he invokes Igate, and she in recompense and recompense abundant and lightly granted befalls the man who prayer whose prayers the goddess receives with favor and she grants him good success for hers is the power to do this so Igate is very important uh, in the spiritual path that we follow and it's more than what people consider to be just a goddess of witchcraft for among the children who were born to Oranos and Gaia had stations allotted among all these she was a certain office she has a certain office nor did the son of Kronos use violence towards her nor deprive her of the rights she had among Titan gods of the older generation but she holds her her apportioned share as formerly from the beginning 
nor because she is an only child does the goddess have the less honor and privileged place in earth in in the sky in the sea also but much of much but as much as others and far more seeing that zeus honors her she greatly assists and advantages any man as she pleases in the assembly of the people and man, and man shine when she sh wishes it and when men put on their armor to go to battle where men are wasted the goddess is present there also to give out the victory and the glory to whichever side she wishes and she sits beside solemn kings where they give their judgment she is great too when men contend in athletics and the goddess stands by those whom she will and assists them one and and one who by his force and strength has won a fine prize and lightly gladly carries it home and brings glory to his parents she's great also in standing by the riders as she wishes and those who on the gray green the hard wrecking sea make a living and they pray to gate and to the deep thunderous earth shaker and lightly the high goddess grants a great haul of fish and lightly too shake she takes it away when it was has shown if such is her pleasure she is great in the farms also to help Hermes swell the produce and the driving and driven herds of cattle and the wide-ranging goats flocks and the flocks of deep fleece sheep all these also at her pleasure she waitens to many out of few or make few out of many thus though she is only the single child of her mother she's honored with high office among all immortals so Igate is way more than what pagans and wiccans not to bash on them just label her as the goddess of witchcraft as you heard she is helps in so many aspects of life so definitely take that away if you take nothing else away on at least as of now so Zeus, son of Kronos, made her too, made her too the protector of those children who, after her laid eyes on the dawn, the many light beaming. So she, from the beginning, has protected children, and these are her offices. Rhea, submissive to the love of Kronos, bore glorious children, Estia and Demeter, Era of the Golden Sandals, and strong Aedes, who under the ground lives in his palace, and his heart without pity. So again, Aedes is not a loving, at least according to Hesiod, is not a loving God because he is just the God over the dead in the underworld. So you can't really have um, favorites when it comes to just the mortals in the underworld world when it comes to the normal uh, people. So let's see. Yet has a heart without pity. And the deep thunderous earth shaker in Zeus of the councils, who is the father of the gods and of mortals, and underneath whose thunder the whole wide world shudders. But as each of these children came from the womb of its mother to her knees, great Kronos, great Kronos swallowed it down with the intention that no other of the proud children of the line of Oranos should ever hold the king's position among the immortals. For he had heard from Gaia and from Stori sorry Oranos that it had been ordained for him for all his great strength to be beaten by his son and through the design of the great Zeus. Therefore he kept watch and did not sleep, but waited for his children and swallowed them. And Rhea's sorrow was beyond forgetting. But when she was about to bear Zeus, the father of mortals and gods, then Rhea went and entered her, or entreated her own dear parents, and these were Gaia and Starry Aranos. To think of some plan by which, when she gave birth to her de dear son, the thing might not be known, and the fury of revenge beyond the devious devising Kronos the Great, for his father and his own children, whom he swallowed. They listened gladly to their beloved daughter and consented and explained to her that all that had been appointed to happen to concern Kronos, who was king, and his son of the powerful spirit, and sent her to Lyktos, in the fertile countryside of Crete, at the time when she was to bring forth the youngest of her children, great Zeus in the earth, and gigantic Gaia, took him inside her, in wide Crete, 
and there to keep him alive and raise him. So I was just sitting here thinking, it's kind of funny that she went to Oranos, and we all know what Kronos did to his father. So he's going to try to devise a plan to get some revenge as well, because he has been castrated by his own son. So he is not really too happy with his son right now anyway. So, so there Earth arrived through the running Black Knight, carrying with him, and came first to Lictos, and holding him in her arms, hid him in a cave in a cliff, deep under the secret places of earth, in Mount Agion, which is covered with forests. She wrapped a great stone in baby clothes, and this she presented to the High Lord, son of Orinus, who once ruled the immortals, and he took it then in his hands and crammed it down into his belly. Hard wretch, nor saw in his own mind how there had been left him instead of the stone for a son, invincible and unshakable for the day to come, who soon by force and his hand defeating him must drive him from his title and then be lord over the immortals. And presently after the shining limbs and the power of the Lord Zeus grew great and with years circling on great Kronos, the devious devising, fooled by the resourceful prompting of Gaia, once again brought up his progeny. First, he vomited up the stone. So remember, so this is the famous story of Kronos. He thought he ate, he ate all the other brothers and sisters of Zeus, thought he was going to eat Zeus, but he ate a stone, and now he's going to throw it up. So first he vomited up the stone, which last he swallowed. And this Zeus, and this Zeus took and planted in place on the earth of the wide ways, and holy Pitho, and the hollow ravines under Parnassus, to be portent and wonder to mortal men thereafter. So there is a stone in Greece now that supposedly is the stone that uh, Kronos threw up, um, and it's still there today too. So. And as it says, it's there for mortal men to wonder thereafter. So it is there if you guys want to go see it. Then he set free from his dismal bonds the brothers of his father, the, Oren the sons of Oranos, from whose his father in his wild temper had enchained, and they remembered and knew gratitude for the good he had done them. And they gave him the, the, they gave him the thunder and the smoky bolt and the flash of lightning, which Gaia the Gigantic had hidden till then. And we, with these to support him, he is Lord over immortals and mortals. Iatos took Clymene, the light step daughter of the ocean, to be his wife, and mounted into the same bed with her. And she bore him a son, Atlas, of the powerful spirit. And she bore him high vaunting Menetios and Prometheus, of the intricate and twisting mind, and Epimetheus the gullible, who from the beginning brought bad luck to men who eat bread, for he first accepted from Zeus the girl Zeus fashioned and married her. So Epimetheus, uh, so Prometheus created Pandora, the first woman, and Epimetheus married her. So Minotios was mutinous, and Zeus of the wide brows struck him with a blazing thunderbolt and dropped him to Erebus because of his too great hardihood and outrageous actions. But Atlas, under strong constraint at Earth's utmost places, near the sweet-singing Hesperides, standing upright, props the wide sky upon his head, and his hands never wearied, for this was the doom which Zeus of the Council dealt out to him. So, as we know, Atlas, his punishment is to hold up the Earth in mythology. And in painful bonds, he fastened Prometheus of a subtle mind, for he drove a stanchion through his middle. Also, he let loose on him the winged spread eagle, and it was feeding on his liver by day and would grow back by night and would grow back to size from what the wing spread bird had eaten in the daytime. But Ericles, the powerful son of the light footed Alcamini, killed the eagle and drove the affliction from Eoptus' son, and set him free from all his unhappiness, not without the will of high-minded Zeus of Olympus, in order that the reputation of the Thebes-born Heracles might be greater 
even than it had been on the earth that feeds many. So you notice that the gods, the Titans were punished, but for the most part, they were eventually forgiven and set free. Kronos was forgiven and now he is over the Elysian fields and um, Prometheus, Heracles was able to rescue him. So Prometheus that was having his liver eaten out by an eagle is set free and he is free now with the blessing of Zeus who allowed Heracles to save him. With such thought in mind, he honored his son and made him glorious and, ang and angry as he had before. He gave up his anger. For Prometheus once had matched wits against the great son of Kronos. It was when gods and mortal men took their separate positions at Mykonae, and Prometheus, eager to try his wits, cut up a great ox and set it before Zeus to see if he could outguess him. He took the meaty parts in the inwards, in the innards thick with fat and set them before men. So this is this origin of um, giving offerings to the gods. Prometheus came up with it, this idea of how, what to offer the gods. And here it is again, just one more time, since this is what we're talking about now. And Prometheus, eager to try his wits, cut up a great ox and set it before Zeus to see if he could outguess him. He took the meaty parts, or the good parts of the ox, and the innards and the thick with fat, and set them away before men, hiding them away in the ox's stomach. But the white bones of the ox had he arranged with careful deception inside a concealing fold of white fat, and set it before Zeus. At last the father of the gods and the men spoke to him, saying, Son of Yaptos, conspicuous among all kings, old friend, how prodigiously you divided the portions. And so Zeus, he knows imperishable counsels, spoke in displeasure, but Prometheus, the devourer, the devious divisor, lightly smiling, answered him again, quite well aware of his art artful deception. Zeus, most high, most honored among the gods of everlasting, choose whichever of these the heart within would have you. And he spoke, and with intent to deceive, and Zeus who knows imperishable counsels, saw it, the trick did not escape him. He imagined evil mortal men in his mind and meant to fulfill them. In both his hands, he took up the portions of the white fat. Anger rose up about his heart, and the spite mounted in his spirit when he saw that the white bones of the ox in deceptive arrangement. And ever since that time, the races of mortal men of the earth have burned the white bones to the immortals on the smoky altars." So that's the origin of the offering to the gods in the ancient days. So we don't we don't do um, really uh, animal sacrifices anymore, but back in the day they did, and that was the origin of why they gave a certain offering to the gods, and the mortal men were able to keep the meat and eat the meat, and the gods would get the bones, basically. Um, so then Zeus, the cloud gatherer, in great vexation, said to him, Son of Yaptos, reverse, reverse in planning beyond all others, old friend. So after all, you did not get, forget your treachery. So Zeus, who knows imperishable counsels, spoke in his anger, and even remembering his, this deception thereafter, he would not give the force of the weariless fire to the ash tree people. Not to people who inhabit the earth and, all, and are mortal, no, but the strong son of Yaptos outwitted him and stole the far-seeing glory of weariless fire, hiding it in the hollows of a fennel stalk that bit deep into the feeling of Zeus, who thunders on high, and it galled the heart inside him. And when he saw the far-seeing glory of the fire among the mortal people, and next for the price of the fire, he made an evil thing for mankind. For the renowned smith of the strong arms, took earth and molded it through Zeus's plans in a likeliness of, of a modest young girl. So here's the story of the birth of Pandora again. And the goddess gray-eyed Athena dressed her and decked her in silverish clothing over her head, and she held with her hands an intricately wrought veil in place. I wonder to look at and over this, on her head, she placed a wreath of gold, one that very, one that the very renowned smith of the strong arms had fashioned, working it out with his hands, as a favor to Zeus the father. On this, he had done much intricate work, a wonder to look at, 
wild animals such as the mainland and the sea also produce. In numbers, he put on many the Im imitations of living things that have voices, wonderful, and it flashed in its beauty. But when, but when to replace good, he had made the beautiful evil thing. He led her out where the rest of the gods and the mortals were, in the pride and glory that the gray-eyed daughter of the great father had given. Wonder seized upon immortals and mortals as they gaze on the sheer deception, more than mortals can deal with. For from her originates the breed of the female women, and they live with mortal men and are great sorrow to men. In hateful poverty they will not share, but only luxury. As when inside the overarching hives the honeybees feed their drones, and these are accomplished in doing no good, while the bees all day long until the sun goes down do their daily hard work and set the white combs in order. And the drones spend their time inside the hollow skeps, garner the hard work of others in their own bellies. So Zeus... Uh, the high thunder established women for mortal men as an evil thing. <laughs> so, so it's um, so funny how um, people would take that nowadays, you know. And they accomplished in bringing hard labors. And Zeus made in place of the good yet another evil. For whoever escaping marriage in the sorrowful thing women do in, is unwilling to marry must come then unto, come to a mournful old age, bereft of one to look after it, and in need of livelihood lives on, and when he dies the widow inheritors divide up what he has. While if they the while if the way of marriage befalls one, and he gets himself a good wife, one with the ways suited to him, even so through his lifetime the evil remains, balancing the good and he whose luck is to have cantankerous children lives keep lives keeping inside him discomfort which will not leave him in his heart and mind. For this evil there is no healing. So it is possible to hide from the mind of Zeus, uh, nor escape it. It's not possible to hide from the mind of Zeus or nor escape it. For not even the son of Yoptos, the gentle Prometheus, was able to elude the heavy anger, but for all of his... Numerous shifts, force, and the might chain confine him. So that's kind of funny that is saying that um, it's a punishment to man to get married to a bad wife. Um, and having spoiled children, that was even more of a punishment to man. So Zeus is going to punish mankind by having a wife that is no good and then cantankerous or children you just can't stand, you know. And um, that's kind of funny that he's saying that that's the punishment for man. And if you decide not to get married, then you're going to end up with a lonely, miserable life. So now when Oranos, the father, was bitter at the heart against Aberios and Kodos and Geese because he was so struck by their towering vigor in the statue, uh, stature and beauty, therefore he bound them in strong bonds and settled them under the wide-eyed earth. There, dwellers under the ground, and with a life full of agony, they lived at the utmost end, and at the edges of the great earth, with long spell of grieving, and at their hearts of great sorrow. But Zeus, the son of Kronos, the other immortal divinities, whom Rhea of the fair tresses had borne to lovely Kronos, brought them back to the light, and again an instigation of Gaia. For Gaia had told the gods the whole truth from the beginning that these three victory, the th these three victory would be one in glorious honor. For a long time now, the Titan gods and those who were descended from Kronos had fought each other. With hard-hearted struggles, ranged in opposition all through the hard encounters. One side, the haughty Titans fought from towering Orthius or Othris. But they, on the other side, the gods, the givers of good things, whom Rhea bore in love to Kronos, these fought from Olympus. These then, with heart hurting rancor against each other, fought for ten full years continually. Nor was there any release from hardship of hostility, nor in any end to it for either side. And the balance of fighting was even. But after Zeus had been given the three gods all they wished and needed, ambrosia and nectar, which the very gods themselves feed on, then the bold spirits rose up again, 
in the hearts of these three. And when they had eaten of the nectar and delightful ambrosia, then to these three spoke the father of the gods and the mortals, Hear me, O shining children of Oranos and Gaia, while I speak out what the heart in my breast commands me. All of our days the titan gods and we, who were born of Kronos, have been fighting a long time now in a battle <clears throat> for the sake of the victory and power. Now therefore show yourselves against the titans in the grim encounter and show the gratefulness and the greatness of your strength, your hands irresistible. And remember the love we gave you, the kindness, and how had been how you had been treated before you came back into the light out of cruel bondage. Out of the under, out from under the gloom and the mist, and all through contri our contriving. So he spoke, and in turn, unfaltered Kodos answered him, "We need to speak. What you say is not unknown. We ourselves know it. Your counsel and perception are beyond all others. That you are the immortal's defender against this dark ruin, for it is only by your forethought we ca ever came back up again from the gloom and the mist." and from the merciless bondage. Through you, O Lord, son of Kronos, when we suffered what we never had looked for. Therefore now, with stubborn spirit and a resolute purpose, we shall be defenders of your power in the grim encounter and fight against the Titans in the st strong shock of battle. So this is what all happened during the famous battle of the Olympians versus the Titans. So he spoke in the gods, and the givers of blessing ascended as their heart what uh as they heard what was said and the spirit in them was insistent on battle more even than it had been and they launched an unwelcome onset all the female and the male gods alike on that day and the titans and those of the generation of chronos and those whom zeus had upraised from under the earth an erebus back to the light and fierce gods and mighty with strength overmastering each and all alike had a hundred strong arms bursting out of his shoulders, and on the shoulders of each grew fifty heads above their massive bodies. So these are the Hecatonchires again, these creatures. And now at this time, these stood forth against the Titans in a bitter combat, wielding in their ponderous hands steep cliffside boulders, while on the opposite side, the Titans stiffened their battalions, in eager courage, in the force of in the work of force, in hands with conspicuous on each side, and the infinite great sea moaned terribly, and the earth crashed aloud, and the wide sky resounded, as it was shaken, and tall Olympus rocked on its bases, and the fan of the winds of the immortal, and the strong shudder drove deep into gloomy Tartaros under the suddenness of the foot rush and the quenchless crashing of their feet and their powerful missiles. So each against each other, they threw their re-echoing weapons, and the noise of either side outcrying went up to the starry heaven as the great war crying they drove each other on. So it was a massive battle where they were like just making, destroying the earth. I mean, it was a huge battle. Now Zeus no longer held in his strength, but here his heart fell deep with fury. Now he showed his violence entire and indiscriminately. Out of the sky and off Olympus, he moved, flashing his fires incessantly. And the thunderbolt, the crashing of them, and the blaze together came flying, one after another from his ponderous hand, spinning whirls of inhuman flame, and with it the earth in the giver of life, and cried out aloud as he, she burned, and the vast forest and fire screamed. All earth was boiling with it. In the course of the ocean, and the barren sea, and the steam, and the heat, and it was engulfing the titans of the earth, while the flames went up to the bright sky unquenchably, and the blaze and the glare and the thunders and the lightning and blinding in the eyes of the titan gods, for all they were mighty. The wonderful conflagration crushed chaos, and to the eyes seeing and ears hearing the clamor of it, it absolutely would have seemed as if the earth and the whole heaven above her had collided, for each what had been the crash arising and as the earth wrecked and the sky came piling down on top of her. Again, this battle of the gods and titans, it was extreme in mythology. It was, it's like no war you've ever seen before. So vast was the crash heard as the gods collided in battle. The winds brought on with their roaring a quake of earth and dust storm. 
and with thunder and with lightning and with blazing thunderbolt, the weapons thrown by great Zeus. And they carried the clamor and outcry between the host opposed and a horrible tumult of grisly battle uprose. And both sides showered, showed power in the fighting. Then the battle turned before that, before on both sides attacking. And the fury of the rage fought on through the strong encounters. But now the three, Kotos, Brieros, and Geese, insatiated a battle, stirred the grim fighting in the foremost. For from their powerful hands they volleyed three hundred boulders, one after another, and their missile flights overwhelmed the titans in darkness. And these they drove underneath the wide wade earth, and fastened with them, they are in painful bondage, for now they had beaten the titan gods with their hands, for all their high hearts. They drove them as far as underground as the earth is distant from heaven. Such is the distance from earth's surface to the gloomy Tartaros. For a brazen anvil dropping out of the sky would take nine nights and nine days in, to land on earth on the tenth day. And a brazen anvil dropping off the earth would take nine days, nine nights to land in Tartarus on the tenth day. A wall of bronze is driven around it and night is drifted about it in the throat of the triple circlet while upward from it. And there grow and branch the roots of the earth and on the barren sea. And there the Titan gods live buried under the darkness, in the mists. And this is by decree of Zeus, the cloud gatherer, in a moldy place, at utmost edges of monstrous earth. There is no way out for them. Poseidon had fitted brazen doors, and the walls run around enclosure of everything. And there, Geese, Kodos, and the great-hearted Brios, <laughs> the one I can't say, Brios, are settled as faithful sentinels for Zeus of the Ages. And there for the gloomy earth and for Tartaros of the mists and for the barren great sea and the starry heaven, for all these, the spring and the sources stand there all in order, an unpleasant moldy place, and even the gods loathe it. It is a great chasm and one where inside the gates of it, within a whole year's completion, he would not come to the bottom. But storm blasts on cruel storm blasts would sweep him one way and another. And this is a monstrous place. And even the immortals fear it. And here stand the terrible houses of dark night. And the building the buildings are sheathed in the dark of the clouds. Before them, Alice, the son of Iaptos, stands launch, staunchly holding up the wide heaven upon his head and his arms unwarily sustaining it. And there, night and day, come close to each other and speak a word of greeting and cross the great threshold of bronze. For the one is coming back in and the other is going outdoors. And the house never at once contains both of them. But at every time, while one of them is out of the house, faring over the length of the earth, the other remaining indoors waits for the time of her own journey when the other one comes back the one carries for people on earth light the far flashing while the other one carries sleep in her arms and he is death's brother 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 so it's interesting that they take turns coming out night and day and um she is um brings sleep or hypnos death's brother or death being thanatos she is night, the destructive veiled, the destructive veiled in a cloud of vapor. And then there, the children of night, the gloomy, have their houses. These are sleep and death, dread divinities. Again, Hypnos and Thanatos. Never upon them does Helios, the shining sun, cast the light of his eye beams. Neither when he goes up the sky nor comes down from it. One of these across the earth in the wide sea ridges goes his way quietly back and forth <clears throat> and is kind to mortals. But the heart of the other one is iron and brazen feelings without pity are inside his breast. And when he takes hold of anyone, he keeps them. Even the immortal gods hate this one. And there at the front stand the, stands the resounding halls of the earth gods of Aedes, the powerful, and of Persephone, and there they stand before them, a dreaded hound on watch. 
Who has pity, but a vile straight stratagem. But is vile. As people go in, he fawns on all. With actions of his tail and his ears. But he will not let them go back out. But there he waits to eat them up. When he catches any going back through the gates. So, what it's talking about is... um. Nobody that the gods hate Thanatos in mythology. So we'll go back a little bit saying that Hypnos, Thanatos are the dreaded gods because it's death. And the gods hate death in mythology. Um, I don't know where it is. I don't remember. But there is a quote. There's a famous quote. It may be Sappho again that said that the gods hate death. In, they, no, it's um the gods... Um, death is an evil thing, for if it had been good, the gods would die. So yeah, so Thanatos and Hypnos are not friends of the gods, and he has the heart of iron, it says. And now it's talking about death, and when you die, you go to Hades, and Persephone and Hades are the king and queen, and the gates of Hades, the place, is guarded by Kerberos, is what is described now the dog and then it won't in Kerberos and will not let you out and it eats up the souls that tried to leave the gates of 80s so there is no coming back is basically what it's saying so there is it and there is how's a goddess loathed even by the immortals dreaded sticks eldest daughter of the ocean who flows back on himself and apart from the gods she lives in her famous palace which is over roofed with towering rocks and the whole circuit is ungirded with silver columns and pushes heaven and seldom does the daughter of Thomas fleet footed Iris or Iris come her way with a message across the sea sea's wide right ridges. So talking about how Iris or Iris brings a message to these gods or goddesses because Iris or Iris, however you want to say it, was the person personal messenger of Era. So those times when dispute and quarreling start among the immortals, and some of those who have their homes on Olympus is lying, and Zeus sends Iris to carry the many-storied water that the gods swear their great oath on. Thence, in a great golden pitcher, that cold water that drizzles down from a steep sky climbing cliffside, it is one horn of the ocean stream, and travels off the holy river a great course through the night's blackness under the wide white earth, and the water is a tenth part of all, for in nine loops of silver swirling water around the earth and the sea's wide ridges, he tumbles into salt water. But this stream, greatly vexing the gods, runs off the precipice. And whoever the, of the gods who keeps the summit of snowy Olympus pours of this water and swears on it and is forsworn is laid flat and does not breathe until a year is complete nor is the god let come near ambrosia and nectar to eat. But with no voice in him and no breath, he is laid out flat on a made bed, and the evil coma cov covers him. But when, in the course of the great year, he is over his sickness, there follows on in succession another trial, yet harsher. For nine years he is cut off from part of the everlasting gods, nor has anything to do with the council, their festivals for nine years entire, but in the tenth, he once more mingles in the assemblies of the gods who had their home on Olympus. Such an oath did the gods make of the insatiable or the imperishable primeval waters of Styx. It jets down through jagged country. So when the gods make an oath, it is a serious thing, um, as you've heard just now. And there, for the gloomy earth, and for Tartaros of the mists, and of the barren great sea and the starry heaven. For all these things, spring and sources stand there, all in order, an unpleasant moly place, and even the gods love it. For there, for there there are the gates, and the brazen threshold is self ungrown, unshakable, and gripped into the branches' roots in front of it, and apart from the immortals are settled the titans, the other side of gloomy chaos. Only the glorious helper of Zeus, the loud crashing, are settled in houses along the foundations of the ocean. Kotos and geese, that is, but of strong grown Bre Breros again. 
the deep striking shaker of the earth, Poseidon made a son-in-law and married him to Chemopili, Chemopolia, Chemopolia, his daughter. Now after Zeus had driven the titans out of heaven, gigantic Gaia in love with Tartarus by means of golden Aphrodite, bore the youngest of her children, Typhio, Typhus, the hands and, war, and arms of him are mighty and have work in them. And the feet of the powerful God were tireless. And up from his shoulders there grew a hundred snake heads and those of a dreaded dragon. And the, head licked the, with, and the heads licked with dark tongues. And from the eyes on the inhuman heads, fire glittered from under the eyelids. And from all his heads, fire glared and flared from his eyes glancing. And inside each one of those horrible heads, there were voices that threw out every sort of horrible sound. For sometimes it was speech, such as the gods could understand, but at other times the sound of other the sound of billowing bull, proud eyed and furious beyond holding, or again like a lion shameless in cruelty, or again it was like the barking of dogs, a wonder to listen to, or again he would whistle so the tall mountains re echoed it. Now that the day there would be have been done a thing of the past mendling. <clears throat> and he, Typhus, would have been master of the gods and mortals, had not the father of the gods and men been sharp to perceive it, and gave a hard, heavy clap of thunder, so that the earth gave grisly reverberation. In the wide heaven above, in the sea and the steam, streams of the ocean, in the great underground chambers, in the great Olympos was shaken under the immortal feet of the master as he moved. And the earth groaned beneath them, and the heat and the blaze from both of them was on the dark-faced sea. From the thundering and lightning of Zeus, and from the flame of the monster, from his blazing bolts, from the scorch and the breath of his storm winds, and all the ground and the sky and the sea boil and towering waves were tossing and beating up all over, and down the promontories in the winds of these immortals. And the great shaker of the earth came on in Hades, lord over the perished dead, trembled, and the titans under Tartaros, who lived beside Kronos, trembled to the dread encounter and then did an unending clamor. But now when Zeus had headed up his own strength, seizing his weapon of, th of thunder and lightning, and the gl glower glowering thunderbolt, he made a leap from Olympus and struck setting fire to those wonderful heads set about on dreaded monster. And then when Zeus had put him down with his strokes, Typhon crashed and crippled in the gigantic earth grown beneath him. And the flame from the great Lord so thundersmitten ran out along the darkening steep forests of the mountains and as he was struck. And a great part of the gigantic earth burned in the wonderful wind of his heat and melted as ten melts in the heat of the carefully groved cru crucible when craftsmen work on it, or as iron, though that is the strongest substance, melts under the stress of a blazing fire in the mountain forest worked by the handicraft of Hephaestus inside the divine earth. So earth melted in a flash of blazing fire, but Zeus in tumult of anger cast Typhus into broad Tartaros. And from Typhus comes the force of winds blowing wetly. All but Notos, Boreas, and clearing Zephros, for the generation is of the gods, and they are a great blessing to men. But the rest of them blow wildly across the water and burst up in the mist face in the open sea. So Typhon was another challenge of Zeus, that he had to fight this giant monster, as you heard, that had like dragon's wings and dragon's heads and all this stuff. It's a scary thing. And Zeus had to conquer it because it's, if he had not fought, Typhon would have been the uh, king of the gods. So this brought heavy distress to mortals and rage and malignant storm and blown from veering direction and scattered the ships, drowning the sailors. And there's no remedy against this evil for men who, who run into such winds as these on the open water. And then again, across the limitless and flowing earth, they ruined the beloved 
They ruined the beloved works of the ground dwelling people, but overwhelming them with dust and hard tornadoes. So this part's interesting that's going to come up now because now it's going to talk about how Zeus was declared king of the gods after all of his trials fighting the Titans, fighting Typhon. I mean, he's gone through a lot and now he's going to be declared the king of the gods. And here is the story of how that happened. And then, like I said, it's pretty cool. So it says, now when the immortal gods had finished their work of fighting, they forced the Titans to share with them their titles and privilege. Then by the advice of Gaia, they promoted Zeus, the Olympian of the Wide Brows, to be king to rule over the immortals. And he distributed among them the titles and privileges. Zeus, as king of the gods, took his first wife, Metis, who is the mother of Athena. And she knew more than all the gods or mortal people. But when she was about to be, when she was about to deliver the goddess of the gray-eyed Athena, Zeus, deceiving her perception by treachery and by slipping slippery speeches, put her away inside his own belly. So he ate her, kind of <laughs> like Cronus was trying to eat his children. Zeus ate Me Metis, and this was and this was by the advice of Gaia, a story Orinos. For so they counseled, in order that no other everlasting god besides Zeus should ever be given the kingly position. For it had been arranged that from her, children surpassing in wisdom should be born, first the gray-eyed girl, the tragedia Athena, and she is the equal of her father in wise counsel and strength. But then a son to be king over the gods, and mortals was to be born, was to be born of her, and his heart would have been overmastering. But before this, Zeus put her away inside his own belly, so that the goddess should think of for him, for good and, and for evil. So that right there, I always thought that was interesting that, so Athena was going to be born, but she was going to have a brother that was going to overtake Zeus and become the king of the gods. Can you imagine if that story continued and that Zeus did not eat Metis? And there was going to be another god that was going to be the king of the gods that if people would worship now and not Zeus. Zeus would be like um, Kronos and Kronos' father. Just another king in the lineage, but now it's this new god. I always wondered, I wondered who it could have been, you know. So next, Zeus took to himself Themis, the shining, who bore him the seasons, lawfulness and justice and prospering peacetime. These are concerning to oversee the actions of mortal people, and the face to whom Zeus of the councils gave the highest position. And they are Clotho, Lactius, and Atropos, and they distribute to mortal people what people have, for good and for evil. Eurynome, daughter of Okinos, lovely in appearance, bore to Zeus the three graces with fair cheeks, and these are Aglia, Eus. <laughs> Euphorisini and lovely Thalia. And from the glancing of the hidden of and from the glancing of their lidden eyes, bewildering love distills. There is beauty in their glances from beneath brows. Zeus entered also into the bed of fruitful Demeter or Demeter, who bore in Persephone of the white arms, and she that Adonis ravished away from her mother. And Zeus of the council granted it. Then again, he loved Mnemosyne of the splendid tresses, from whom were born to him the nine muses with veils of gold, the nine whose pleasures is all delightfulness and the sweetness of singing. So now you're seeing the lineage of the generation of the guys that we are all familiar with. You're starting to really see the names we know now. Leto who laid in arms with Zeus of the Aegis, bore Apollo and Artemis uh, of the showering arrows, children more delightful than all the other Orians, Orinians. Last of all, Zeus took Era to be his fresh consort, and she, lying in arms of the father of the gods and mortals, conceived and bore E.B. to him, and Ares and Elethea, then from his head by himself, he produced Athene of the gray eyes, great goddess, weariless, waker of battle noise, leader of armies, a goddess queen who delights in war cries, onslaughts and battles, while Era, without any act of love, brought forth glorious 
the Ephestos. For she was angered and quarreling with her husband in Ephestos in arts and crafts surpasses all the Iranians. Now Era was angered and quarreled with her husband, and because of this quarrel, she herself brought forth a glorious son, Ephestos, without any act of love making, was Zeus of the Aegis. But he, apart from Era, had lain in love with a fair faced daughter of Okinos, the lovely haired Thetis. Hermetus, who he deceived, for all she was so resourceful. For he snatched her up in his hands and put her inside his belly, for fear she might bring forth a thunderbolt stronger than his own. And therefore the son of Kronos, who dwells high, seated in the bright air, swallowed her down all of a sudden. But she then conceived Pallas Athena, but the father of the gods, men gave birth to her near the summit of Triton, besides the banks of the river. But Medus herself, hidden away under the vitals of Zeus, stayed there. She was Athena's mother, worker of right actions, and beyond all the gods, beyond all the mortal people and knowledge. And there Athena had given into her hands what made her supreme over all the immortals who had their homes on Olympus. For Medus made the armor of Athena, terror of armies in which Athena was born, with her penelope of war upon her. So Medus is the one that made the armor of Athena as she jumped out of the head of Zeus. Because you remember, in, she jumps out already full clad in war armor. And it's saying that her mother Meta made, or Medus, made the uh, armor for her. So Amphitrite and Poseidon, loud thundering earth shaker, was born great Triton. Widely powerful, he who, sustaining the sea's basis, besides his dark mother, and the Lord, his father, dwells in the golden house, a dreaded god. Now Cytheria to Ares, stabber of shields, bore panic and terror, dreaded gods, who battled the dense battalions of men and battled, in horrible war. They with Ares, sacker of cities. She also bore him Harmonia, she whom high-spirited Cadmus married, Maya, daughter of Atlas, mounted the sacred bed of Zeus, and bore Hermes the good, the herald, of, the herald of the immortals. Simile, daughter of Cadmus, lay in love with Zeus, and also bore him a glorious son, Dionysos, giver of good things. She mortal, he immortal, but now both are gods together. Alcamini, lying in love with Zeus, who gathers the clouds, bore him powerful, powerful Ericles. Ephestos, of the high renown, in the strong arm, took Glea, youngest of the graces, to be his fresh wife. Dionysos, he of the golden hair, took blonde Ariadne, daughter of Minos, to be his blossoming wife. And Cronion Zeus caused her likewise to be immortal and ageless. Ericles, the strong and courageous son of the light stepping Alcamini, after he had completed his sorrowful labors, took the daughter of the great Zeus and Era of the golden sandals, Ebe, as his modest wife. So that's what um, I always remember about Ebe, is that she is the wife of Heracles. On snowy Olympus, blessed he who, having ended his long work, lives now among the immortals without sorrow, ageless all his days. To Elios, the, unwear the unwearied son, the glorious daughter of Okinos, Perseus, or Kirki, or Circe, as most people call it, call her Circe, but they would call her Kirki. And the great great king Aetis, and Aetis is son, uh, son of Elios, who pours his light on mortals. Married by the council of the gods, the fair-faced daughter of the Okinos, the terminal river, Adia, who subdued to him in love, and through golden Aphrodite bore him Medea, of the slim angles. Farewell now, you who have homes on Olympus. So we are going to wrap it up. So this is the end. So farewell now, you have ho yeah, for la. farewell now, you who have you who have homes on Olympus. Farewell to the islands, the mainland masses, and the open sea that is between them. But now, a sweet-spoken muses of Olympus, daughters of Zeus of the Aegis. Sing out now the names of those goddesses 
who went to bed with mortal men, and, they, and them themselves immortal, bore to these children in the likeness of the immortals. Demeter, shining among goddesses after the embraces of the hero Iason, in the sweetness of love, brought forth Plutus. In a three in three times plowed field, there in fertile countryside of Crete, a good son, who walks over the earth and the seas wide ranges everywhere, and he who meets with the giving of hands between them is made a prosperous man. To whom great wealth is granted, to Cadmus, to Cadmus, Harmonia, and daughter of Aphrodite the Golden, bore Eno, Simile, and Aguea of their fair face, Atoni, who was taken wife of Aristeus, of the deep hair, and Polydorus, and the high crowned Divus. Caliori, daughter of Okinos, lying in embraces of powerful minded Chrysor, Chrysoria. Yeah, I'm messing it up again. <laughs> Through Aphrodite, the golden and bore him a son most powerful of all men, mortal men. Geryones, whom Heracles is a great strength, in his great strength killed over the drag foot cattle and water washed Erythea to Tithonos Eos the Don bore Memnon of the brazen helm, king of the Ethiopians, and the lord of Amethion. And then, embraced by Kephalos, she engendered a son, glorious Phaeton, the strong, a man in his likeness of the immortals. And while he still had the soft flower of the splendor of youth upon him, still thought the light thoughts of a child. Aphrodite, the lover of laughter, swooped down and caught him away and sent him in her holy temple to be her nocturnal temple keeper. A bright divinity. Jason, the son of Aeson, by counsel of the everlasting gods, took Medea, daughter of Aetis, king under God's hand, and led her from Aetis's house, having completed the many painful trials that the great proud king Pelias had imposed upon him. For he was oppressive, hard-hearted, hard and heavy-handed. But Jason did all and came back to Eoclos, after much suffering, and brought back with him on the fast ship the girl of the glancing eye, Medea, and made her his blossoming wife. And she, submitting to the love of Jason, shepherd of the people, bore him a son, Bedesos, and Chiron, the son of Philira, Phil Philira, fostered him on the mountains. And so the purpose of Zeus was accomplished. But of the daughters of, Nis of Ner Nereus, the old man of the sea, and one Samanthe, shining among goddesses, joined to Echos, and love through golden Aphrodite, bore him Phocos, while Thetis, she of the silver feet, submitting to Peleus, bore him Achilles, the lion-hearted breaker of warriors. And Cytheria of the garland, joining in love's delight, with the hero Anchis, bore him Anias among the forests uh, in many folded valleys of the peaks of Eda. Kirki, daughter of Elios, is the son is the son of Hyperion, who joined in love with hard hardy minded Odysseus and bore him Agrios and Latinos, a man faultless and powerful, and also the golden Aphrodite bore Telegonos. In these far, far away and utmost magical lands were kings over the Tiresians of glorious reputation. Calypso, shining among goddesses, joining in love's delight with Odysseus, bore him Nasithos and Nesinos. And these went to bed with a mortal man, and them themselves immortal, bore to them children in the likeness of the immortals. And now, a sweet spoken muses of Olympus, Daughters of the Zeus of the Ages, of Zeus of the Ages, sing at the generation of women. Like her, or like her, or like her, who? <laughs> That's literally the end, right there. 
And that is it.